Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I've never studied anything about bilingual acquisitions, so hopefully I can say something about where we're up to with um, first language acquisition that might be useful for um, when you're thinking about studying bilingual acquisition. So, we called the book Child Language Acquisition Contrasting Theoretical Approaches, and we called it acquisition rather than um, learning or something, because even that is quite a loaded term. So do children learn language from the language that's going on around them, or is it more a case of um, kind of triggering something that's already innate in them, in which case, you know, you might say that it's kind of acquired rather than learned. And we also called it Contrasting Theoretical Approaches as the subtitle, because it seems to me that most books before then seem to just kind of assume one theoretical viewpoint or another and kind of and start from there, which is the case with um, a lot of research papers as well. So we wanted to try and dig into the different theoretical approaches of first language acquisition and um, see what we can say about them, which isn't always easy, right? Because there isn't a, you know, there's no one book that sets out what a generativist view of language acquisition is or what a constructivist view of language acquisition is. It's always a matter of kind of piecing it together from um, various sources. But the way we kind of um, characterised it in the book, and it, you know, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but we um, kind of drew a distinction between two basic approaches to language acquisition. So generativist approaches, or nativist approaches, or universal grammar, or formalist approaches, by that we mean approaches which share the assumption that children are born with something linguistic, not just born with the propensity to learn language, which of course um, you know, is, is kind of trivially true, but born with some actual innate linguistic content. Things like categories like verb and noun and some kind of expert or minimalist style um, rules for combining them into phrases and sentences. And then again, the, the opposing view, the constructivist or the uses based functionalist view, isn't so much uh, a single theory in its own right as more just a, a collection of proposals which are defined by not assuming um, at least this type of innate knowledge. So what I'm going to do in this talk is um, kind of show how this generativist versus constructivist debate plays out in, in three of the main areas of uh, first language acquisition, focusing on, um, on basic syntax, basic morphology and um, questions as an, as an example of uh, movement constructions. So. First, just a bit of general theoretical background. So, what is assumed to be innate under generativist approaches? And again, you know, if, if you ask 100 different people, you'll get 100 different answers. But here's what these approaches seem to share at their core. So, an assumption that children are born with um, empty categories. Of course, they have to learn the words that fill in those categories in their languages. And what use is it being born with categories? Well, you're not only born with categories. You're born with some knowledge of how those categories combine into phrases and how phrases combine into sentences. So the idea would be that you're born with knowledge, for example, that a verb phrase can contain a verb and a noun phrase. You don't know the order they come in, of course, because that varies between languages, but you know that uh, a, a, a verb phrase can be formed uh, from a verb and a noun phrase. You're bo born with the uh, movement rules that are used for forming uh, passives and questions. And um, you're born with movement rules that also allow for inflection, in inflection morphology, and, um, and functional categories too, not just lexical categories like verb and noun, but functional categories like inflection, which are uh, required for morphology. Constructivist approaches don't see um, language as a collection of rules operating on uh, categories, but as a set of constructions where a construction is defined um, fairly loosely as a pairing of a form and a particular function. So if we think about the English transitive construction, it's a, a very kind of a heterogeneous construction, but it's vaguely associated with the idea of one entity acting on another. Some constructions have a slightly uh, a better specified meaning. So the double object and um, dative construction in English, subject verb, indirect object, um, object, is pretty much to do with the meaning of uh, transfer. So if you say John blinked Sue a uh, snug, you know that it's something to do with uh, either literal or metaphorical transfer. So the idea under a construction-based view is that this meaning is imparted by the construction itself, the form, this abstract form, rather than the individual um, words. So constructivist approaches assume that kids start out by um, storing frozen phrases in exactly that uh, form from the input. 
And then gradually analogize and schematize across them to get towards more abstract constructions. So if we think about the SPO transitive construction, in the end, constructivist approaches assume that adults will have a subject verb object transitive construction, which isn't really um, so different from what you would end up with under a generativist account. The difference is how you get there, that you start out with um, frozen phrases and move gradually towards a more abstract construction through these things that are slot and frame patterns where the frame is the fixed bit like I kick and then you can put different words in there to um, in, in the slot position. So we're going to talk about three uh, test case debates which all relate in some way or another to, uh, to fairly basic uh, morpho syntax. So first we're going to look at how children acquire um, word order which is obviously particularly important in languages like English where word order conveys a lot of the who did what to whom of the sentence. So in English, for example, how do we learn, or how do kids learn that English follows subject, verb, object, word order? So the classic generativist answer to, um, to this question is that children are born with a number of word order parameters that they set on the basis of the language they hear. So one of these, for example, is the head direction um, parameter, which reflects whether the head comes before or after the um, complement in the verb phrase. So in English, the head comes first, so we would say uh, kick the ball within the verb phrase, whereas Turkish is obviously a head last, head final language, so you would say um, the equivalent of the man the ball kicked. So the idea is that you're born with this um, switch, and you switch it to head first or head final on the basis of the language that you hear. So one problem that faces a parameter setting um, theories is that many utterances that you hear are going to be ambiguous with regard to different combinations of parameters. So imagine a sentence like, uh, yesterday laughed the man, in a V2 language like German. So I've only talked about one of the parameters, but there's another parameter which reflects whether or not you're learning a V2 language, whether you're learning a language where the second element always has to be a verb. So imagine you hear, yesterday laughed the man, some different combinations of parameter settings are possible. So it could be that your language essentially follows the SV order, so you want to set your specifier head parameter to the setting that corresponds to SV, and you've just got a different order here because you're learning a V2 language, and that's what's making the verb be in the second position. Or it could be that you're not learning a V2 language, and you're genuinely learning a language that follows a VS order. So individual utterances can be um, ambiguous when it comes to um, setting the parameters here. So a lot of the approaches that have arisen since this was um, I pointed out a long time ago by um, Gibson and Wexler is to do with how children might use other information to um, set parameters. So Christoph et al. pointed out the languages that follow the VO setting, uh, like English, generally place stress on the right of the phrase, so you would say the man kicked the ball, Whereas languages with the OV setting would generally place it on the left, so you'd say the man, the ball kicked. So the idea is that children could use phonological prominence to um, set a parameter. And the advantage here is that you don't have to be able to, uh, you've got a way to kind of bootstrap into the system. You don't have the problem of recognising which is the verb and which is the object in the first place. So Christoph used a, a high amplitude sucking um, paradigm to, it, it measures how quickly the, the, the baby sucks. Do they um, suck more quickly when they, when they detect a change in stimuli than, than when they stay the same? And they showed that infants could, in fact, tell the difference to, between, between strings of language with these different stress patterns, even in their non-native language. So they do seem to be sensitive to the um, contrast. Although, of course, it's a step further to say not only can they, are they sensitive to the contrast, but then they actually can use that to set the um, head direction parameter. So for this to be true, you would have to assume that the correlation was innate and also that it would hold for um, all the languages that, that children could find themselves learning. So another uh, generativist style proposal for how children might learn word order is um, an old proposal, but uh, a, a quite a successful one. Um, by Pinker. And Pinker starts from the observation that um, setting parameters is problematic because the categories like subject, object and verb are obviously 
abstract syntactic categories that don't correspond, um, they're not observable in the world. So Pinker argued that what you need is innate linking rules that link to categories that are observable in the world, um, i.e. these semantic categories like agent, patient and action. So simplifying a bit, it's actually a linking hierarchy rather than just rules, Pinker assumed that children are born with innate semantic categories like agent, patient and action, and innate syntactic categories like subject, object and verb, and linking rules that link the two. So the child's um, best guess is that if you hear, if you know that a word relates to an agent, it's going to be a subject. If you know that a word relates to a patient, it's going to be an object. And if you know that a word relates to an action, it's going to be a verb. So if you then hear a sentence like the man kicked the ball, uh, and, you can, you can, and you understand what's meant by that, then you can see that agent, action, patient order is being used, and use your innate linking rules to read off the fact that English follows subject, verb, object. Uh, word order. And one thing that isn't always appreciated about um, Pinker's proposal here is that people uh, talk about verbs or individual non-canonical sentences that might be a problem for the proposal. But actually the idea is that you just use these basic sentence types to, um, to parse the sentence and then once you've done it you can build a tree which will allow you to uh, parse complex sentences. So in principle as soon as you've parsed the man kicked the ball you can use your innate knowledge of, um, of some version of um, the X-bar schema to, to tell that uh, you, you're parsing the sentence in this way and use that parse tree to then parse sentences like the situation justified the measures, well obviously the situation isn't an agent, justifying isn't really an action, and the measures are um, certainly not a patient on which an action is um, performed in that way. So Pinker himself points out that if a child did hear a kind of non-canonical sentence like you will get a, a spanking off me, um, the child might risk setting up uh, uh, or reading off an incorrect rule for English. But then in a, a 1987 version of the theory, he argued that all you need to do to, to kind of solve this is to make learning more um, probabilistic, so they're not doing this kind of one-shot learning of the, of the individual sentences. A second problem for Pinker, and again, we don't have um, time obviously to go into um, the, the kind of nitty-gritty of this, but it's arguably some ergative languages um, violate the linking rules for at least uh, some sentences. So ergativity is obviously a very um, complex syntactic uh, phenomenon, but there are at least some cases where it's not true that the agent is a subject, the action is a, a verb, and the object is a patient. Okay, so onto constructivist approaches of the acquisition of basic word order. So, as I said, the idea is that you start out with um, phrase and phrases, and move gradually to slot and frame patterns, and then on to um, fully abstract constructions. So, in the book, we review a lot of different studies which are designed to investigate the constructivist claim that um, young children, Thomas Dello draws um, three as a kind of line in the sand for the start of abstract syntax. As we'll see later, that's almost certainly far too uh, late. But that's what we mean basically by young children. So the idea of these studies is to investigate the idea that children younger than about three are using these frozen phrases and slot and frame patterns and don't yet have a fully abstract subject verb object construction. So for example, in novel verb studies you teach children a novel verb like meeking or tamming in one construction and see if they'll use it in a, in a um, construction that they haven't had it in. And generally the finding is that up until around about three, children will use nouns in constructions they haven't heard them in. But if you teach them uh, a verb like, um, just in a construction like this is called meeking, then they generally aren't able to use it in a subject verb object transitive construction until around about three. So weird word order studies, so this, um, the first one of these was ACTAR um, 99. So you teach children three novel verbs in in this type of study. So some are taught in a conventional SVO order, some are taught in a weird word order, or one of two different weird word orders, SOV or VSO, so early the car gopping, or tamming early the car. And then what happens is you try and elicit, you give children different um, agents and patients, or different characters, 
uh, and different actions to describe, and you'll see if they use the weird word order for these novel verbs or whether they crept to SVO. So what's interesting is that older children virtually always crept to SVO. So if they won't countenance a weird word order for um, gopping because they've got, according to a constructivist view, a subject verb object um, fully abstract construction schema which they kind of can't help but use when they're trying to produce a sentence. For the youngest group, it's kind of intermediate. So sometimes they're correcting to SVO and sometimes they're following the weird word order. So it's not as if they are solely forming new slot and frame patterns for um, the novel verb, in which case they'd 100% follow the weird word order. They seem to be intermediate. Sometimes they're forming, or some kids are forming a slot and frame pattern uh, based on the weird word order, but there's also some evidence too of emerging abstract subject, verb, object, uh, knowledge of word order at this age. But it could be that these production tasks where kids have to say things are too difficult for young children. So some other methods have been used too. So one is act-out tasks. So in act-out tasks, children are just given uh, a sort of novel action. So keeping means, I don't know, hitting someone over the head with a, a toy hammer or something. And then they give children the toys and say, can you make Cookie Monster Keith a uh, big bird? And again, the idea was that children um, can't do this until after around three or so. So uh, a classic study of this is Acto and Tomasello. So uh, just before three, only about four out of ten children are able to, um, to enact this correctly. Whereas by the time you've got relatively old three-year-olds, they're all able to do this correctly. But then maybe these experiments are too hard as well. They seem easy to us. But a lot can go wrong if you're a two-year-old or a three-year-old. You might just pick up the toy that you prefer, and once you've done that, then it's hard to not make that the agent of the uh, atomic action or whatever. So children of, um, sorry, not children, experimenters have been uh, simplifying these, these tasks down using preferential looking or pointing. So in Gertner, Fisher and Isengard, the children would see an animation a bit like this, and they would hear the frog is glorping the teddy, or the teddy's glorping the frog, and the children don't have to do anything. The eye movements are recorded using a central camera. And we just look to see where the kids are looking longer at the matching picture than the non-matching picture. Uh, and so in Gertner, Fisher and Isengard, this was a looking time version. And they found that two-year-olds and even uh, an age group who weren't quite two were able to look significantly longer uh, than chance at the matching screen. And by the time you have a slightly older um, kids, so children who've, who've just passed their second birthday on average. This was a study done uh, uh, by some of my colleagues at Liverpool. By the time their two kids are able to follow an instruction to actually point to the matching screen, which kind of gives you a cleaning methodology because you never really know what's going on with looking times. So are they just looking at the matching one and then looking longer at the other one to see what's going on? By the time they're two, they can see an animation like this, be asked, okay, what, show me the frog is glorping the teddy, or vice versa, and they will um, reliably point to the point to the correct one of these uh, from around about age two. So where are we with the acquisition of basic word order? So it's interesting. So it started out, you know, the argument was that children don't have abstract knowledge until around um, three, was the kind of line in the sound that Tomasello drew. But then these, that was based mainly on these production tasks and the act-out tasks. But then these preferential looking and pointing studies have pushed the age um, younger and younger. But what does this really mean? So the issue isn't the age at which children have knowledge, it's how they got it. Did they do it by having innate knowledge of uh, X-bar theory and by setting parameters or by um, the d doing the type of semantic bootstrapping that Pink is talking about, or did they acquire it by generalising over uh, input sentences as constructivist account would say? Now the problem you've got here is that the it might seem that the younger you can show knowledge, the more likely it is that they've um, that, that knowledge was innate, rather than that it was learned from the input. But it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string type question. So if a, if a three-year-old does it, does that mean they have to learn it from the input? If a, if a two-year-old does it, was there time to learn it from the input in two years? Uh, who knows? So on the other hand, we want to be careful of shifting goalposts, right? So if constructivist accounts say, kids can't do this till three because they're learning it from the input, and then it turns out they can do it at two, 
constructivist accounts really then come back and say, oh, well, I still think they did it by learning it from the input. They just took a year less than we thought they did. So we need some way to kind of um, break into this circularity. You know, even if children could do this by one, would it necessarily be impossible for them to have done that by generalising over the input? Not in principle. So I think we need some way other than age to try and differentiate between the two um, accounts here. So I think in general, and we'll see this across the three domains I'm going to talk about uh, today, the way to differentiate between generalist and constructivist accounts isn't to say at what age can kids do something, which isn't going to be too informative about which theory is right, but to look for predictions regarding um, evenness or, or unevenness. So... Well, we'll come back to this again at the end because, you know, it's not, um, this isn't completely uncontestable. But what is argued in a lot of constructivist studies is that Jones-Fist accounts, because they're based on the notion of parameters or formal rules, that these rules, are, again, with some caveats and some exceptions, are going to apply equally to all members uh, of a category. So there's no reason why, in terms of uh, producing a transitive utterance, for example, kids should be better with um, some types of subjects or objects than others. So what's interesting about these constructivist studies is although people f generally focus on the age, and you know, even the authors themselves generally focus on, oh, kids can't do this until such and such an age, actually I think the interesting findings in these studies are kind of buried uh, a bit deeper and relate to unevenness. So in most of the elicited production studies, so um, Dodson and Tomasello is a, a typical example, nearly all the time when kids do produce an SVO transitive with a novel verb, it nearly all has pronouns as both arguments. So they almost never say things like big birds tanning cookie monster. They almost always say things like he's tanning it. And of course that's not unexpected in terms of um, you know, discourse, that's probably what you or I would say. But you can use it as one piece of evidence which seems to suggest that children might be basing their earliest utterances on these slot and frame patterns like heating it, he's Xing it. Certainly, a, an awful lot of their utterances could be generated by these slot and frame patterns, which doesn't prove that they are, but they certainly are um, compatible with, with that idea. It's very similar in, in the uh, Weird Word Order study with uh, Acta. When children corrected to subject verb object word order they all make they about 50 percent of all arguments they used pronouns which again is some evidence that they might be relying on these pronoun based slot and frame patterns when they followed the weird word order they never once used a pronoun in any of those utterances and the experimenter never used pronouns when teaching the weird word order in training so again you know you could argue that these studies are um, are kind of slightly odd methodologically but at least in terms of what kids are doing in these studies, it suggests that they are learning um, slot and frame patterns based around full MPs in the weird word order conditions, but they're using the slot and frame patterns they already have um, based around pronouns when they're uh, correcting. And finally, even in the act out studies, two-year-olds are much better if they're asked to act out he's making it than if they're asked to act out the dog's, the dog's making the car. So again, this could be taken as evidence that kids are using these um, slot and frame patterns even when they're um, comprehending utterances. Finally, um, uh, there's a priming study that I haven't uh, talked about, but basically what happens here is the experimenter and the child take it in turns to describe animations, and the idea is that if the experimenter uses a passive, this should get the child to use a passive so we can see uh, what age children are able to um, produce a novel passive. And this, uh, the first priming study uh, on, on children that lives at passives is by uh, Savage et al. And this found that children um, didn't seem to be produced, didn't seem to be primed to produce um, new passives until over four. Now this finding in its own is almost certainly um, misleading because there's been a lot of priming studies since then which have shown um, abstract priming of passives and dativs and so on in, uh, in children younger than four. So that conclusion, which is the kind of headline finding, um, doesn't seem to be replicated. But what's more interesting is that even the younger group did show priming in a lexically specific condition where children were primed with, with utterances which they could potentially use in their own utterances. 
So in other words, if the experimenter said um, the vase got broke, broken by the hammer, then the child was no more likely to produce a passive than an active when it was their turn to produce a sentence. But if the experimenter said it got broken by it, then the child tended to produce a passive that said it got kicked by it or whatever it was. So again, it seems that giving children these slot and frame patterns that they can use in their own utterances makes them more able to produce uh, these sentence types that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Okay, so now on to um, inflection and morphology. So we're looking here at how children learn to inflect words. We're going to look uh, mainly at verbs. How children learn to inflect verbs for person and number. Now, a lot of the early work on this was in English, but English is a terrible language to study if you want to study inflection and morphology because there's almost uh, none of it. In the present tense, you put an S on or you don't put an S on, and that's about the end of it. In terms of uh, progressives, we've got a, uh, you know, we've got a, a bit more, a little bit more variety in, in terms of the different forms that an auxiliary can take, uh, but, but still not much. You really want to study uh, a language like Spanish, where there are lots of, or any highly inflected language, where every person number uh, combination is marked with a different inflection on the verb. Okay, so how does inflection work under generativist and constructivist accounts? So the idea on the gentleman's accounts is that when the child produces an utterance, she retrieves the relevant verb and the relevant tense or agreement morphine and combines them uh, using a rule. So informally speaking, we can just talk about combining a, a, a verb and a morphine in a kind of a box and arrow diagram like this. But if we want to talk about it formally, um, uh, under a minimalist framework, then what happens is the, the verb raises to the inflectional uh, head here where it picks up the uh, or checks off the inflection and then um, the subject moves to um, IP here to, to give the correct surface word order. So, sorry, this is my, I'm sure you understand this, this is for my undergraduate psychology students who um, you know, are completely unfamiliar with uh, syntactic trees and so on. So I say to them, don't worry if you don't understand it. The point is that this rule, this movement rule here that takes the verb and moves it to um, I is not sensitive to the identity of the verb or the identity of the morpheme. It's just a rule that acts on that particular variable. So it seems to me at least that the gentleman's account predicts that as long as the child knows the morpheme S and knows the morpheme ED, knows the verb play and knows the verb walk, if you can raise one verb to I and have it pick up the inflection, then you should be able to do that with any verb and any inflection um, that you know. And obviously the constructivist account makes different predictions here. Oh, sorry, offers a different uh, account of, of how it's all learned. So the idea is that the child first stores whole verb forms, uh, at, at including auxiliary and verb combinations, and indeed whole utterances too. So the first thing that a child could do under a constructivist account is just to retrieve a ready stored a whole utterance, a verb, or an auxiliary plus verb combination, or a ready inflected verb form. And when the child has stored a few of these forms, so in principle beginning as soon as two of each type have been stored, the child is going to schematise across them to have a slot and frame pattern similar to what I talked about before, but at the level of morphology rather than syntax. So a verb plus S slot and frame pattern or a verb plus ED slot and frame pattern. So in a constructivist account, when you're trying to produce a form, you could retrieve a ready inflected form, a single word, an auxiliary plus verb combination, or even a whole sentence. Or if none are available, you can, again, a slot and frame patterns can be formed at any of these levels. So you could simply insert the verb into one of these um, slot and frame patterns that you've formed. So it might seem, once we look at this, at the point at which the schema has been formed, it might seem that these are almost sort of notational variants, just different ways of saying the same thing. All these things are just metaphors anyway, right? None of this is actually literally happening in the child's head. Is it actually any different to say that a child is retrieving the verb stem and the morpheme and combining them using a formal rule, or to say that the child is putting the verb into a, a verb plus s slot and frame pattern? If we're just talking about one, it seems like sort of just different metaphors for the same underlying process. But actually, these, do, these two accounts do make different predictions. So because the gentleman's account posits a formal rule, it seems to me at least to predict that once the child can produce one form using this rule, they should be equally good at adding 
So if they can put an S on plays, then they should be able to put an S on all the different verbs that they know. And they should be, conversely, able to add all the different morphemes that they know onto that verb. So they should show full productivity. Now, of course, they're not going to know all the verbs, and they're going to know all the morphemes. But it seems to me that once they do know the relevant verb and the relevant morpheme, um, there should be no reason why they can't produce it. Constructivist accounts don't predict full productivity, as firstly the child might not have wrote learned the relevant form, but they might have formed some slot and frame patterns, but not others. So a constructivist account, you might have a child who's got a verb plus s slot and frame pattern, so they can produce plays or walks, but not a verb plus ed slot and frame pattern, so they can't produce um, walked, for example. Now there's a bit of a complication here, because Full productivity under a genitivist account does not mean that children will never miss off inflection and morphemes. So we're very um, influential and I would say generally well accepted idea uh, uh, under genitivist accounts is that um, tense and agreement marking is optional um, for young children. So children learning uh, many languages make these root infinitive errors. So it's not the case that children are always going to supply the morpheme. Children are argued to go through a stage in which they think you can say uh, he like cake and that it's just as grammatical as he likes cake because tense and agreement are optional. So we have to a caveat this um, a bit. So it seems to me that the prediction is this. Children might not always add third singular s to a verb when it's required. You know, why should they? they? They think you can leave it off. But they should be equally good at doing it with different verbs. They shouldn't be better at correctly supplying in English third singular s uh, with some verbs than others. So do children show equal performance with different verbs? So Thiexton and colleagues did an elicited production study where it was something like yesterday John blicked, every day he and we looked to, they looked to see how many children could say um, blicks. And only about half of the children could um, do that with a novel verb, although they could all but one do it with a familiar verb. So you um, would have to argue under a genitivist account that they do have um, knowledge of the morphine. But you know, maybe this is children just confused by the novel verb here. But then at Liverpool we did a study where we did listed the production of third singular s in English with real verbs. So across 48 different verbs, we found a correlation between the proportion of third singular versus bare forms in the input and the correct production of third singular s versus its omission. So it doesn't just seem to be a case of pure optionality where children are just choosing whether to produce the s or not. They seem able to produce the s for verbs that they've heard a lot in that form and not for verbs they haven't heard a lot in that form. So these numbers are quite, quite hard to understand understand because what people don't always realise is that actually third singular s forms in English are very rare compared to bare forms because you've got the infinitive, the first singular, you know, all those other forms that I showed you in the table. So actually fits with 23% s forms is the most inflected verb that we found in English. So uh, accordingly in our production study children always said it fits, they never said it fits, whereas climb is the least is the verb that it receives the least third singular s in the input in our study. Only 5% of the time that children hear climb does it have an s on it. And accordingly, they showed a much lower rate of, um, of correct production, just 65%. So 65% of the time they said um, he climbs, and 35% they said he climbed. So in other words, a 35% error rate for climbs as opposed to a 0% error rate for fits. And across those 48 different verbs, um, you get a large correlation here. So I'd say this is evidence against the genitivist claim of, um, of full productivity, but also positive evidence for a constructivist claim that children start out by learning ready inflected um, forms of the verb uh, directly from the input. And the higher the frequency of that form in the input, the greater the probability that children will be able to uh, retrieve it when they're required. So what about the second prediction that, okay, children think they don't have to put a morpheme on a verb, it's optional to uh, mark tense and agreement, but they should be equally good at supplying all the different morphemes that they do know. There's no reason why uh, they should be better at supplying some of these morphemes than others. So as I mentioned at the start of this section, English is a poor language to test it on because we don't have very many different morphemes. 
So I'm going to tell you about a Spanish study by Aguado Uribe and Pine. And if you just look at the major uh, verb types in Spanish, there are 18 different present tense um, morphemes that you can have that reflect different person number forms. I showed you six, and then there's three different conjugation classes as well. Um, obviously, they're not all uh, completely different, but um, you get the idea. There's a lot more different potential forms that a verb can take, even in uh, the present tense. Now, what you've got to control, so what we're interested in is how many different morphemes do children use per verb. So there's a lot of studies that, sh older studies that showed that children don't use many different morphemes per verb, but that on its own isn't evidence for a constructivist approach because what you need to do is look at adults. Adults don't tend to use actually many different morphemes per verb just because we don't tend to talk about different person number contexts that much. So what you need to do is use the adults as a control. So what they did in this study was they got an adult corpora and a child corpora, you know, the, the parent and the child, then they match the two corporate in terms of the overall size, the overall number of utterances, the number of verbs. They restricted it to morphemes that both the child and the parents had used and therefore did uh, know in some sense. And they looked to see how many different morphemes on average the child used with each verb. So what's interesting is even adults use very, very few morphemes per verb. Obviously under any account, adults are completely productive with inflection and morphology, but they don't look productive hardly at all in corpus studies. They only use slightly more than um, two, more, two different person number forms of each verb on average, but that's still significantly more than children do, even with these controls in place. So Aguero, Aguero, uh, and Pine use this to argue that children uh, are less productive with inflection morphology. They use fewer inflection and morphemes um, per verb than adults do, even after you've controlled for differences in um, vocabulary and corpus size and so on. Okay, so now on to the third prediction of generativist accounts of inflection morphology. So what does this claim of full productivity predict? So children might not always supply agreement marking morphemes when they're required because they think tense and agreement are optional in many languages. But, and again we need a caveat here, provided they've actually learned the right morpheme, they should never use the wrong one because the rule knows which morpheme marks which combination of person number agreement. So again, this is the, um, you know, the undergrad version that I give to my uh, students who've never studied linguistics, but I wanted to um, just you know, get a, a, kind of a, a formal defini definition of, of what it means to say you know, why, why the child shouldn't um, use the wrong form here. So the idea here is that if the syntactic features realised by an inflected form are compatible with the syntactic features dominated by a functional head, the syntactic features headed by this functional category can be checked off. And, in, and these are uninterpretable features that need to be checked off or the derivation would um, crash. So the idea here is that you can't produce the wrong form here. If you know that you're producing a, if the inflectional head is such that you know that you need a third plural form and you retrieve a third singular form, the derivation is going to crash, right, because it has a feature that isn't compatible. So when I argue this in papers, people often say, I don't, you know, does the account really predict this? So I thought it was worthwhile um, gathering some quotations from, um, from generalist papers where they really you know, do say children don't use the wrong person number mark forms of a verb. Now, of course, we all agree that they will often not mark tense and agreement. What's the issue here is do they mark tense and agreement incorrectly sometimes? And we've got a lot of quotations here suggesting that the, the Jones physics accounts predict that they do um, rarely or, or never. So, Children simply don't say, I like ice cream. Children don't make agreement mistakes. A well-established fact is that errors of substitution are rare. Agreement errors are superbly rare. Agreement is always almost correct. Agreement is correct with main verbs. So there's a lot of um, studies arguing here that children just don't make these types of errors. And these errors are obviously hard to spot in English because they're you know, using a, a, the wrong person number marked uh, form of a verb would always look like just using a non-finite form of the verb. So again, we need to study a, a language like Spanish where these errors are more obvious because the child is using a, might use a third person um, plural pronoun with a third singular um, verb form. So for example, elos comer. So we want to know, do these errors 
occur, or are they um, so negligible as to be basically non-existent? And at first glance, it does seem as, as though they are so negligible as to be non-existent. Overall rates of incorrect agreement are around um, 2%. But Rubino and Pine pointed out that this isn't necessarily evidence for a genitivist account because if you assume exactly the opposite account where, much, where children are starting out by producing mostly frozen phrases, of course they're going to make very few errors. So to have a kind of semi-artificial example from English, if a child learns to say, I like, of course they're not going to say, I likes ice cream because you know, they know to say, I like X. They've heard hundreds of I like X. They can just store I like or I like thing as a slot and frame pattern and wouldn't be expected to make the errors. So they, Aguero, Array and Pine argue that what we need to do is look at forms that children rarely use. So to be fair, we need to count from the point at which the child has used that morphine correctly, so we can't just say that they haven't learned that morphine. If we look from the point at which the child has used the morphine correctly, is it true that they never use these morphemes incorrectly? And in fact, this doesn't seem to be the case. So this shows the number of instances of incorrect inflection um, from one child study by Aguada Maria in his naturalistic study. So third singular forms were produced in place of third plural forms on 75 occasions, even starting from the point at which the child has correctly produced the uh, relevant third plural ending. So it doesn't seem that uh, this prediction of making um, no errors is, is well supported here. And if you break the error rates down by person number context, you can see where the overall very low error rate comes from. So if you look at third singular, for example, there's 505 utterances and they're virtually all correct, so an error rate of 0.6%. Whereas if you look at, for example, um, third plural, the error rate is 38%. So the reason the overall error rate is 2% is because it's mainly coming from these 505 very common verb forms that show almost no error, and it's inf influenced very little by these very rare verb forms where the error rates are much higher. So why do children make these agreement errors when they do? So if you look at naturalistic corpora, what often seems to happen is that children incorrectly repeat an unsuitable form from another utterance. So if they hear things like, um, Bill likes cake, then they might repeat um, inappropriately, John and Bill likes cake. And there's also some evidence that children default to the most frequent form in their language. They just, in case of memory failure, produce the um, form that they've heard most often. So we've conducted a number of studies, illicit production studies, showing higher error rates for low frequency forms and that in lots of these cases where children are making the errors, what they're doing is replacing them with high frequency um, targets. So we've done this in studies of Finnish, Japanese, uh, Lithuanian, um, Polish and Finnish. Okay, so we've only got 10 minutes left. I do want to be able to have some questions. So I'm going to go very, very quickly through the... Um, actually, let's just get the questions completely and go on to the summary and conclusions. So we've got some, uh, some time for questions. So across basic word order and inflection and morphology, Children look like they're learning from the input in an uneven way rather than instantaneously um, hitting upon category general rules as would be predicted by parameter setting accounts or semantic bootstrapping or an innate category of inflection or innate knowledge of movement rules. So does this mean that the constructivist account has won? Well, you know, not so fast. So there's different things that could be a possibility, right, in principle. So how about... You know, let's assume the kids do have innate categories, innate parameter settings, innate movement rules, and all the rest of it. Does that mean that they can't have frozen phrases as well, but they can't have slot and frame patterns as well? You know, where do you draw the line here? Even the most ardent genitivist generally assumes at least some frozen phrases. So um, let's to pick one example. Andrew Radford, when he's you know has a, a highly genitivist uh, syntactic. Um, uh, textbook, but even he says, oh, well, of course, you know, I don't know is a, is a fixed phrase in English. That's stored as a phrase. It's not generated every time. So where do you draw the line, you know? Just because you're having these um, innate rules, it doesn't mean that you couldn't store some frozen phrases as well. And, you know, you could also posit, too, perhaps that 
Maybe children are using some slot and frame uh, form. Once, they're, once you admit that they're storing these phrases, why wouldn't they analogize across them sometimes and have some slot and frame patterns? So you can imagine a journalist account which assumes that um, children also have some frozen phrases, which in fact many do. And I haven't actually seen this proposed, but they could also assume some plot and frame patterns too, which would obviously make this very difficult to, um, to falsify or to differentiate from a, a constructivist account. Another possibility is that children do have innate categories, innate parameters, uh, innate movement rules, and so on. And the lexical unevenness effects that I'm talking about are nothing more than kind of surface uh, or surfacey practice type effects. So, in other words, it might, you could argue that children have set the parameters, they've got innate knowledge of subjects, verbs and objects, and they're using, in principle, that abstract subject, verb, object um, rule or the x bar schema to generate every subject, verb, object sentence that they know. It's just that they've got a lot of practice at doing that when the subject is he and the object is it, and very little practice doing it with um, long and complex um, MPs. So again, um, there's no reason why a gentrist account couldn't um, posit this uh, in practice. Again, there's going to be an issue of um, whether it's falsifiable, whether it's different from a, a constructivist account. Um, but it's certainly an account that you can imagine uh, in principle. And also, the constructivist account has its own weaknesses too. So the constructivist account is very good at explaining unevenness early on, why it is that children are better with some verb forms than others, or, or some sentence types than others, in terms of these early frozen phrase, or these early stop and frame patterns, it's much, much weaker on, uh, on its account of generalisation. So if you take kind of Tomasello 2003, his famous um, book as a uh, kind of um, view of where the constructivist position is, or at least um, was in 2003, you know, there's chapter after chapter of, um, of these very early lexical effects and, and, uh, and slot and frame patterns and so on. But then there's only a couple of pages with some general, uh, very general ideas about how these generalisation processes uh, might happen. Some constructivist researchers have started to make some progress in this area by uh, positing computer models that can generalise on the basis of things like um, phonological similarity in terms of um, this is mainly in verb inflection, where verbs tend to cluster in uh, phonological uh, neighbourhoods. Um, Merkovic, who's actually at um, York St. John, is a, is a good example of this for Serbian, and we're doing some work on this in Finnish, uh, Polish, and um, Estonian um, with Felix Engelman. But the syntax, you would really need to have kind of semantically based uh, analogies here, which um, no one's really taken on that task of. of of doing except banking chain in these kind of toy models because we've basically got no idea how to code development and semantics incorporate in a way that would uh, allow for the generalizations. So in conclusion, I want to say that um, the debate between constructivist and generativist accounts should really come down to evidence. So researchers on both sides, and I you know hold constructivists uh, to task for take constructivists to task for doing this just as much as generativists. There's a temptation to think that if you can describe some particular phenomenon in terms of your favourite model of syntax, then that model is supported. But that's not necessarily true. It's all about finding phenomena for which the different theories make different predictions about what's going to happen in an experiment or what's going to happen in a naturalistic data set and testing them using the data. Okay, thanks.